In episode 1, we looked at how the Cat Welfare Society set out to change the way our society responds to issues concerning cats, advocating a humane approach instead of resorting to the culling of animal lives. The success and progress of this strategy against culling has paid off. Still, the road ahead stretches long and wide when age-old issues of abuse, abandonment and neglect continue to plague the lives of many cats. Just how are we as a nation to cross these hurdles? In recent years, there has been a series of high-profile cat cases that have placed cat hoarding, abuse and abandonment in the spotlight. While our animal law and enforcement protocols struggle to catch up to this reality, the toll this takes on the cat community in Singapore continues to mount. If you look in the environment, there are a lot of intentional cat abandonment cases. Um, there's a lot of, for example, uh, non-neutered cats around, homeless cats. Um, sometimes there are a lot of socially irresponsible feeders leaving food behind. And then, not to mention, in recent cases, looking at the media, there are also uh, a number of abuse cases uh, in multiple locations in Singapore. Currently, the society deals with about 2,400 cases a year. And out of that, we can safely say about 80% are cases no longer relating to community cat issues. We, we, have, we have successfully addressed feeding and breeding. Um, they are roaming pet cat issues, defecation along corridors, um, even owners who can't maintain hygiene within their, their own HDB uh, flats with animals or, or pets. Yeah. The Cat Welfare Society attends to around 10 to 15 cases of cat hoarding and neglect every year. Usually, these cases are uncovered when a neighbour lodges a feedback about odours and other issues. But that is also when the situation is already prolonged and have reached a critical level. Attempting to resolve these issues often requires mediators and volunteers to step into the lives of these cat owners to offer extended help. One such owner, whose family faces eviction together with their 45 cats, opens up to Farina about his situation. Actually, it started, uh, we started having cats when we were living in Tampines. And we have uh, eight cats. I think it was from one cat, then after that it grew to eight, then it stopped. So I wanted to foster them, but just that my mum, she's very hesitant not to let them go, you see. You yeah. want them to put them for adoption, but your mother was She don't allow it. Yeah, she will, yeah, she will go missing, she will do doesn't come back for one, two days, call, call, nothing. So after that, we really give up. So I, as a son, just uh, accede to her wish, lah, you know. Although I'm very tired every day, so CWS uh, contacted us and, uh, and from that point of time until now, they've been helping us to give uh, solutions. This hoarder case brought out the fact that we are alerted by cat issues, but we come into human issues. And every time we take on a case, whether it relates to a cat hoarder, whether it relates to an upset, disgruntled neighbour, whether it relates to a responsible caregiver, every single time we go in through the cats, but there's a greater human issue at play. So what the government, uh, what everyone needs to understand, that 80% of our population lives in HDB flats. And a lot of us own cats in HDB flats. So the regulation does need to change, the laws need to change, you know, governed with proper... Um, standards, you know, proper rules to ensure that, harmo uh, that keeping cats can maintain harmonious um, living arrangements with neighbours in our high-rise um, society. Cat Welfare Society really started with mediation as its first and core function. Why do we want to do that? Even when we started as a ragtag team, there wasn't that many of us. But we decided to take on the entire country's problems and tell all the town councils, AVA, if you have a cat issue, please come to us. But um, why did we do that? It's because um, we felt that someone needs to be um, in the intermediary to um, advocate a humane solution rather than letting the cats be culled. At the end of the day, we had the data we had the statistics and the cases to bring it to the government and say that 
you know, there really is a problem. We do so many cases and what do we come up against? We come up against the fact that there is no enforcement for all of these issues that we are dealing with. So we are really um, doing it out of the goodness of our hearts to educate people, convince them and to tell them if you don't um, follow the rules, if you don't want to cooperate, unfortunately we can't save your cats. So the lack of law, which is for the HDB, uh, if let's say I'm a cat owner and I do not have the law supporting for pet ownership, recognised pet ownership, what happens if someone abandons the cat, there will be no traces of the pet owner. So who bears the brunt of it? That is us picking up the mess, which is us, the volunteers, the caregivers, the feeders, um, who has to help all these poor cats. Because if we do not help, these cats will be sent for culling. And we do not want that. So there's only how much a Cat Welfare Society can do. We can definitely do the fight, but we cannot be alone in this fight. We need to work with all the various agencies to give us their support so that we see lesser abandonment cats and we don't have to clear out the mess all the time. To centrally handle a caseload as large as the Cat Welfare Society does, they must rely on a wide network of people covering almost the entire country. When a case hits, connecting with the people on the ground smoothens the whole process of bridging the interest of the feedback provider, government agencies and the local community that cares for cats. Social media has since made that job much easier to quickly locate caregivers, fosterers and volunteers when a case hits. Growing this network, however, takes persistent effort over time, time that mediators and volunteers sometimes do not have when a cat life is at stake. I think Cat Welfare Society or CWS has really been a very strong partner for both the government and town councils and of course the residents as well. And they serve as first responder for a lot of cases to help to mediate. So try and bring people together to try and mediate the issues and try and find a more long-term, again, more long-term, more sustainable and more humane solution. And they've been very effective on the ground, having mediated a lot of cases, having, make, making sure that people's fear are laid, making sure that people who want to keep cats can keep, continue to keep cats as well. And making sure, again, the stray cats or the community cats downstairs are living in, in harmony to, with residents that both like cats and don't like cats. We are much in a much better place now because uh, we have um, some staff now to handle the issues. We have better protocols, we have better partnerships, but we will never be able to fill this hole because uh, the, the issues are just sometimes uh, too big for us because um, enforcement is not addressed. Um, sometimes um, some of the government agencies um, are not uh, privy to the protocols. So these are the challenges that we constantly face on the ground uh, that we need to resolve. So we are looking in the future that the no cat policy in HDB will be gone so that we will see lesser and lesser abandonment cats and there will be a more safer environment for cats to live in as well with people being more tolerant as well as being appreciative of our community cats. There's so many more people who are coming out of the ground mm. in the role of feeder, in the role of mm. caregiver, even in the role of, let's say, donor. You have a lot of people coming forward to say, listen, how, how can I help? And that's something that I think when I started, it was so scarce that when someone said, how can I help? You'd have like a little mini celebration in your head. And now it's more about how can I help? Okay, let me get you a role. Let me give you all of the guidelines that you can use to push yourself forward. Having done this for the past seven years, it's always the same few people who are doing it. There may be new blood coming in, but we hope that more young people will be involved, encouraged to do the job, because it's a never-ending job. We'd find that there were often uh, quite a lot of stray cats uh, living under the bushes and around some of the buildings. And as, as uh, pet lovers, we, um, we sort of felt obliged to you know, bring some food along and make sure they were well cared for and uh, you know, give them some, some treats. And, and over time that grew into um, a more regular uh, sort of feeding schedule where we met people like Ed, uh, who were sort of like-minded people where we both had sort of uh, common goals and, and came together and, and shared our experiences of uh, you know, caring for, for cats. I think a lot of us who are involved in volunteer work or who are part of animal welfare groups a lot of the time we feel helpless, we feel like there's nothing that we can do and so much is outside our control. 
But I feel if everyone comes together and does what we can, when we can, we can really make a difference together. It's all about taking that choice, you know? It's all about making that decision, making that choice to be the one who's responsible, to be the one who does something to help, to be the hero that they need. In episode three, we meet volunteers from all walks of life in various critical roles that make the lives of cats in Singapore better. From caregiving, cat trapping to celebrity spokespeople, find out how you can be a force to be reckoned with to make Singapore a humane nation.